All right, let's go on to our fourth panel now. Now, all of our panels have raised the, the issue of value and what it means and how we use it and thinking about how value squares with equity. Keep those in mind. We all want to accelerate health equity, of course, but we've got to keep value in mind. We heard about return on investment questions. So we're now going to move to our panel on incorporating equity and determination of value. That's going to be Jennifer Bright, Nellie Ganesan, and Charlene Son Rigby. And I think that um, Jennifer is going to be up first. I don't yet see her on my screen. I don't think so yet. She'll be coming up, I'm sure. And <laughs> uh, there. There. I, I oh, there's, ah, good. Now we see her. Thank you very much. Uh, so Jennifer, um, again, name, organization, and why you are on this panel, and then we'll go to our next panelist. Jennifer. Uh, thanks, Cliff. And uh, thanks to VBID and Mark Fendrick for the opportunity to be with you all today. Um, also, a shout out to John O'Brien, who teed up uh, why IVI is part of this conversation. Uh, I'm I, as I, as Cliff said, I'm Jennifer Bright. I have spent my career in um, health policy and patient engagement. And the most recent iteration is my consultation with the Innovation and Value Initiative, where I'm the Chief Strategy and Engagement Officer. And the reason I'm with you today is because I've been leading for well over a year a conversation about the intersection of equity and health technology assessment or value assessment. Uh, and it is indeed rolling a boulder uphill, but I'm pleased to share that we've been on a great journey, and I look forward to sharing that story with you, along with my colleagues, Nellie and Charlene. Great. Let's go next to Nellie. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Nellie Ganesan, and similar to uh, the thank you that has been provided by others, um, wanted to thank the VBIT Center for this discussion. I've actually been on for the whole day, and I say this with so much love, but I attend a lot of these meetings and I don't oftentimes get a lot of new information, but there has been so much good content in this that I think is also gonna be relevant for this discussion. So I'm thrilled to be here. I, um, I sit within a group um, called Morgan Health. Morgan Health is a business unit within JP Morgan Chase, the financial institution, which many of you are probably familiar with. Um, but the difference here is that Morgan Health is focused on um, improving the quality, equity, and affordability of those individuals that work at JP Morgan Chase and where there are lessons learned or best practices that can happen in the employer space, not just within plan design, but also innovation in the marketplace, um, sort of thinking through scale and spread uh, to other mid to jumbo size employers. I lead the health equity work here, which means um, we get to work with our carriers, some of whom we've heard from today. Um, we work closely with Jonay, who was the keynote this morning, um, and also uh, thinking about disparities within our own population, social determinants of health for um, a, a, a population that's uh, covered with insurance, which is a little bit different than other conversations that we've had. But um, that is why I'm here and, and happy to be part of the discussion. Glad to have you on behalf of Morgan Health. Charlene, glad to have you. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm Charlene Sanrigby, and I'm the CEO of Global Genes. Uh, we are a nonprofit enabling rare disease patients and patient advocates. And I'm probably, I no, I think I'm sure, I'm the newest person to value assessment who's uh, speaking today uh, at this event. And I really come from the patient advocacy and technology sectors. And I think I landed on this panel uh, to provide the patient perspective. So from a career standpoint, I've spent the last 20 years building and commercializing big data analysis solutions. And that's mostly been in healthcare. And my last company, we built artificial intelligence technology to accelerate diagnosis of uh, rare disease through genomic sequencing. And so data has really been a passion of mine for many, many years. And I also have a daughter, uh, Juno, with a rare genetic disease. Um, I co-founded a, um, a patient advocacy group called the STXVP1 Foundation after her diagnosis to accelerate development of therapies for her. And so um, that advocacy work led me to broader advocacy at Global Genes, where we have developed a platform uh, called RareX that is capturing and standardizing natural history data across rare diseases. Um, thinking specifically about health equity, health equity is a strategic focus area for global genes. And I, you know, I don't think that it's going to be 
Um, and, uh, well, hopefully it's not a surprise for me to say that, you know, rare disease in many ways is really just synonymous with inequity in healthcare. Um, so only 5% of rare diseases have approved therapies. And, you know, as we think forward in terms of um, the precision therapies that are on the horizon, you know, we're not thinking early enough about value assessment to prepare for those therapies, but you know, equity is still a huge issue today in the current state in um, rare disease. So I'm excited to um, talk about that on this panel today. Thank you. Glad to have you, Charlene. Uh, am I mistaken in assuming that you brought your daughter with you over your left shoulder? That is my daughter, yes. <laughs> Welcome to her as well. Glad she's on board with us today. Thank you so much. Um, well, let's return now to Jennifer. Jennifer, um, Gosh, you have a lot to cover, I'm sure. Uh, in about eight minutes, if that's possible, Jennifer, how'd you get into this issue? What are you doing about it? And what are you seeing from that work? Jennifer Bright. Who might be on mute? Rookie mistake. <laughs> um, so for those that don't know uh, the Innovation and Value Initiative, or IVI, it's in our DNA to ask challenging questions about this field of value assessment or health technology assessment. We're a nonprofit research organization, and we've been working for over five years to influence the thinking and the practice of health technology assessment. Um, and our three core pillars are transparency, patient centricity, and equity. So, so first of all, that should tell you why we started asking questions. Uh, but the way we started this journey was actually during COVID, we co-hosted a webinar series with ISPOR around what was the impact of the pandemic? What, was, what were we seeing emerge as themes and what were the challenges for this field of health economics and outcomes research? Not surprisingly, all of the things that you've heard from prior panels were, were bubbling up, cost, you know, inequities in cost, how the disease, how the pandemic was uh, disproportionately affecting communities of color, the socioeconomic aspects of it, all of it. Um, so equity clearly became a, a very early theme. And so IVI picked up on that and we said, we need to know more, we need to understand more. So throughout 2021, we ourselves hosted a webinar series to begin to dig into what are the aspects of equity? Where does that touch this field and what are the problems? Um, and so from that webinar series, we said, well, we need to lean into this more and ask questions. And that's really in our DNA is to say, well, how can we make this better? So uh, well over a year ago, we started a multi-stakeholder um, project and Charlene and Nellie are among our wonderful stakeholder um, steering group that's been with us on this odyssey. And we began to dig into what do we mean by this? What is the purpose of health technology assessment? How can it be used as a um, force of good to help us understand questions of equity that arise in our decision-making about value? Where do we have gaps? There is an enormous amount of debate and uh, frankly, a lack of consensus about the uh, limitations of health technology assessment, where we've got methods that work and where we don't. We often hear, um, that uh, our data is what limits us. So uh, to Charlene's point, uh, there's a lot of burden on the patient communities to develop the real sources of data about lived experience and impact on uh, patients and families. And that data is often not incorporated into any of the uh, traditional approaches to uh, health economics, uh, cost effectiveness analysis, that kind of thing. So we began to ask questions, um, which is, you know, frankly, the intentionality of asking these hard questions and really exposing where we need to do the work has been our motivation for the last year. Um, and so happily today, not, uh, should be no shock, but today we published uh, a set of uh, learnings that we've come through the last eight months of work, engaging with over 40 stakeholders. It represents over 30 hours of dialogue and many more hours of synthesizing that dialogue and um, trying to identify what are the areas that we can reasonably address and where does the work need to be done and how do we improve uh, what this field is contributing. Um, and so we, the report um, that came out today and is on our, on our website talks about the intersection of equity and health technology assessment in four domains. Uh, one is power, people, and processes. 
Another has to do with the data and the inputs and infrastructure that we have the ability to use all this rich data that exists out in the universe for to answer questions or to identify where we have gaps in uh, blind spots in our decision making. Um, certainly the methods, and I mentioned that. So, you know, all the fancy math on the health economics side that is rather opaque to the patients and families for whom these decisions have a direct impact, we need to talk about them. We need to talk about making them more transparent. We need to talk about how we use mixed methods. It's a constant theme, but frankly, uh, the discussion in the health economics and outcomes research uh, arena has gone on for over 10 years about how we incorporate equity into this work. And yet not a lot has changed about the methods and the, the process. And then lastly, the communication and use. What is this for? If we're talking about value assessment, it can't be just about let's decide what a launch price of something is. I certainly, from the prior panel, the economic impact of a price and a, a cost to the patient is not a small thing. And we absolutely acknowledge that. But there are also myriad other costs borne by patients and families that are a direct um, result of disparities in care. So uh, six to eight years to getting a di an accurate diagnosis. Uh, whether you have insurance coverage or Medicaid, now we've got all this Medicaid shifting around that's going to happen. Um, things like transportation or other uh, out-of-pocket costs that affect families in order for them to even access the care. So these are the kinds of questions that we need to be asking. And to my mind, the question about value needs to pivot from its current focus, which is more end of pipe thinking, waiting for something to be on the market or about to be on the market. And we synthesize the data that we have and we try to make our best decisions. Frankly, that questioning and that time of analysis is too late. We need to start talking earlier. And that's where the power and people and processes come in. We need to start engaging with patient communities to understand what are the questions we're trying to solve? What are the burdens and economic impacts that they are confronting? Because, and then through that in, intentional investigation, design decision tools and modeling and ways of synthesizing information that help all of us see solutions that really have equity at their center. So, so the three takeaways for our report and where we are in this journey uh, if this is a point in time, is we need to think more broadly. We need to think outside the bounds of just methods. We need to think about all the roles that stakeholders play to make change happen. This can't be finger pointing and, you know, payers need to do it differently versus pharmaceutical companies versus patients. And we need to stop asking patients to take all the responsibility for generating uh, good questions and good data. And then fundamentally, I think the conversation needs to pivot to talking about accountability. We have enormous resources and research funding um, and expectation of uh, published literature and things like that. And until the rules of the game change and we start prioritizing questions that put equity at the front and center of this conversation about value, we're gonna be arguing about who, who has to make the first move. And so, um, like I said, we're on this journey. Our next toll station after this conversation is we're hosting our fourth annual public methods summit on Monday, the 13th. And uh, that full day conversation is entirely dedicated to this issue of equity in health technology assessment. So hopefully if you, if I've uh, piqued your interest, hopefully you'll show up for that conversation and get more into the weeds with us. Jennifer, you have peaked it indeed, and we appreciate your outlook on transparency, uh, continuity, patient centricity, and equity. Uh, you are kind of asking uh, for the purpose of HTA and wanting to make it a force for good. Uh, you've got your report coming out today, and it sounds like you're addressing power, people, processes, data infrastructure, methods, and communication of use pointedly. You've indicated that the notion of value must pivot. It's been too late. We need to start earlier in order to help redesign decision tools. Um, and then finally, thought you suggested that we think broadly. Patients shouldn't have to take on all the burden of responsibility and accountability. Uh, you covered it pretty clearly there, Jennifer. You have a very nicely outlined train of thought here. Much appreciated. Thank you. Wow. Let's move on now to Nellie over at Morgan Health. Nellie? Um, give us what you have on those three parts, please. Yeah, 
And thank you. And, you know, I think the the streamline of consciousness, I bet for all three of us, for Charlene as well, is probably this idea of around transparency and accountability. Representing um, an employer today, you know, I think the notion of health technology assessments, we are I should say employers are sort of slower on the uptake of technology assessments. I have the um, benefit of sitting on the board of IVI. And so that is one of my sort of main key goals working within the employer to think about how technology assessments can be integrated um, into the work that we do. But what, um, you know, what I think is, even more so important and happens every day, maybe without the words, is the idea of value being integrated into the work that we do. And so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of how we are structured, because um, I think that that will help um, thinking about how we think about equity. So as I mentioned before, Morgan Health business unit within JP Morgan Chase, um, focus on the employees of JP Morgan. Um, we have about a little under 300,000 individuals that are covered by our uh, health plans, which are Aetna and Cigna. And then we have a small population in California that's covered under Kaiser. I'll talk a little bit about some of the innovative work that we're doing in that space as well. Um, the benefit of having sort of 300,000 people is we're working a little bit almost like within an accountable care. We have knowledge of where these um, and, and not in a creepy way, but we have knowledge of where these individuals live. Um, we know, um, you know what their occupation is, which I think really does impact health outcomes as well and maybe isn't talked about frequently. We know, uh, you know, through claims data, how often they are seeing a primary care provider, um, what their, uh, whether they have hypertension, whether they have high cholesterol, all of the above within this, within this population. Um, also, a benefit of J.P. Morgan Chase, maybe different than some other large employers, is that 80% of that population, 80% of that 300,000 lives in um, about seven to eight different geographies. So I think it gives us the flexibility um, and you know, the novel approaches to work with hospitals, um, providers within those markets, um, potentially other social service organizations when we think about health equity to really do something meaningful to start to address um, some of the challenges that we're seeing within each of those populations. And that's really what we've been doing. We've been around for um, a little over 18 months. For those of you that um, you know, sort of track this, uh, track this media development, um, there was an entity called Haven that uh, was initiated in 2018, which was JP Morgan, Berkshire Hathaway, and Amazon through some lessons learned and, and maybe some lessons not so learned, um, that entity has come down and each of those groups sort of gone on and done their own thing. JP Morgan Chase was still committed to um, looking at the entirety of its population. And then I would say in the launch of Morgan Health, equity was really a sort of founding force of the work that they do. That was in parallel with um, also the, la the larger bank, JP Morgan Chase, had a $300 billion commitment to racial equity that was related to home lending, that was related to mortgages, investments, um, all of these different things. So it was only um, you know, natural that Morgan Health would also be focused on this equity component. Now, what does that actually mean? Equity is integrated into um, innovation work. And so, uh, as I noted, we have these eight different geographies of where we are thinking about what we can do to uh, better close gaps in those populations. And, and within each of those geographies, we have access to um, who lives there, um, what they're, they're uh, again, sort of stratified by race and ethnicity, what the outcomes are. Most of that is all coming through claims data. We've um, been working with our carriers to better understand what our populations look like, but are there things that we can actually implement within those communities or work with partners in those um, in those communities um, specifically, whether that is a breast cancer screening initiative, if we see that screening rates are low, whether that is um, letting our employees know where primary care providers are physically located, if we're seeing that there are high rates of ED use, which I think is something that comes up across the country. Um, so that's the health equity play on the innovation side. Also, as we think about pilots um, that we can do in these markets, what are some criteria, and this is where we are right now, in establishing when we work with vendors within those markets that we wanna make sure we see. Do we wanna make sure that um, all of our vendors have sort of language preferential documents that are available to individuals? Um, are we looking at uh, uh, solutions that are tailored to an entire population um, and, and not creating sort of bias for certain communities? So that's one piece of it. And then the second piece of it, um, 
which I think is is a piece that I'm a little bit more excited about. Well, not to say that I'm not excited about the first piece, but this is um, a little bit more novel to the space. Is um, there is a venture fund that's um, established within Morgan Health that's $250 million line item just for Morgan Health that is related to investing in new technologies. Um, I shouldn't say new, new or existing technologies, but usually between sort of the Series A and Series B, if you play within that, um, within the investment space, that is really um, accelerating the uh, care for individuals with insurance. So it is a little bit of a different population, I think, than many of the folks that are on this, this um, call, but we know that 250 million individuals get their insurance from um, their employer. And so it's a very large population, but um, the, that 250 million that uh, we have that we allot to new technologies in this space, we've really done some hard work internally to think about uh, what it means to integrate equity into an investment like that. So it's not just necessarily looking at their management or their board um, in terms of whether there are people of color, but is there is a solution actually sort of promoting um, better uh, use of better use of care, better access to care for various populations. I think also ensuring that like when we say status quo, we're not looking at the median or the aggregate population, but looking at sort of everybody that's within that market. Um, um, really removing unsol un like unsolic unsolicited bias that we may see from algorithms that's doing employee or patient selection. Um, so that has been, um, you know, th that part is hard. I think a lot of these new technologies, they're very, they're very small staffed. Um, they are focused on their own bottom line, they're focused on funding, et cetera. But I think it's really been um, a great sort of not only exercise, but I think ability for us to look at um, the potential that we have with some of these um, new early stage companies to really incorporate or integrate equity into their um, into their strategy and their roadmap. That's one piece of it. We've made um, four investments to date and um, you know where the, the commitment has been maybe around focusing on equity, but it's not a huge piece of their strategic plan. And we've um, we have members on our team that sit on the boards of those organizations to sort of help that help and move and drive that needle along. So um, I probably utilized my time and um, I'm sure have not covered everything. The other thing I would just say on the results side, Cliff, just to speak to that, one thing that we did um, that just was uh, sort of completed earlier this year is, um, and this is actually with some, with, um, some discussions that we've had with um, Mark from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, who, although we don't have employees in Massachusetts, has been a great partner in helping us think through this, is with our population in California, we actually have integrated health equity clinical measurement into to our um into our contract with them, into our performance-based contract with them to actually collect data of our race and ethnicity on a small set of measures, five measures. And I think there is a press release somewhere on the internet about that. And then um, next year, looking at those numbers and shifting uh, shifting that to, to payment rather than just data collection. So that's been um, very exciting as well. Well, Nelly, thank you very much. Um, you really highlighted the importance of integrating value. Um, and then what I didn't realize is that you really have a good fairly good handle on those 300,000 people. And um, and they're in seven to eight geographies, which means they're at least geographically representative. Um, it seems like you have a great upside potential to learn quite a lot from, from them. Now, they're probably not um, perfectly uh, socioeconomically representative of the country, and we may get into that later, but this is a very, uh, from employer uh, population, very useful. Also, you talked about the pilots, which were very interesting. I'm going to kind of uh, kind of plant a question with you uh, that'll come up later, and that is, you talked several times about integrating equity into investment, and I'll just kind of a almost naive question is like would be, well, how do you do that? What does it yeah. mean when you say we're we're integrating equity into investment? I'm thinking of A and B series and the kind of financial stuff you're talking yeah. about. How do okay. those people think about equity into investment? So teeing you up for that question. Okay, thank you. Let's go move on to Charlene. Now, Charlene, um, Rarex Global Genes. Uh, Charlene, tell us again, or tell us please rather, how you got into this. And I think we know already in part what you're doing, what your activities are, and what you're seeing come out the other side insofar as successes or impacts. Over to you, Charlene. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna actually start with a little bit on my personal experience because Jen brought up this issue around 
getting to the diagnosis. And so I just want to use this as an example sure. to kind of tee up the rare disease patient experience. So my daughter Juno is nine and she started missing milestones when she was about four months old. And this really started us on a three-year diagnostic journey that thankfully ended with a diagnosis. Um, so she has a, a, a disease called STXBP1 disorder. It's a very severe neurodevelopmental disorder. And so symptoms, just to give you a sense, symptoms include seizures. Sometimes they start the first day of life, global developmental delay, fine and motor issue, gross, uh, fine and gross motor issues, and severe to profound intellectual disability. And because she had um, what at the time was considered an atypical presentation, meaning she wasn't presenting with seizures, that's what started us on this long process. And so diagnostic odysseys are these multi-year journeys and they can have many steps. People can have misdiagnoses. And this is just one of the equity challenges for rare disease patients. Um, and the problem is, is that getting to that accurate diagnosis is really critical get to getting access to the right care. So I feel really fortunate that, um, you know, Juno's diagnostic journey was three years. Um, as Jen pointed out, you know, it can be an average of, you know, six to eight years. And for some patients, it can be decades. Um, and so I, you know, I guess that we were fortunate in that we live in San Francisco. My daughter is seen at a world-class academic institution uh, at UCSF. And even with this situation with, you know, kind of the, if you will, in best case, the wind at, um, at our sails, we underwent over 30 tests and we were denied genomic testing multiple times before we were finally approved and got whole exome sequencing. And you know, after that diagnosis, access to appropriate care is still a challenge, an ongoing challenge, and for all of the reasons that people have been talking about today. But, you know, that just is kind of one, one example of a rare disease patient experience. And, you know, so thinking about that in terms of um, our, you know, moving to my organization. So I'm pretty new to Global Genes. We actually just merged with uh, RareX, which is the organization I came from in December. And so we've been in the, you know, rare patient advocacy space for over a decade while RareX was, you know, kind of a, a new two-year-old startup. And um, so what, RareX was focused on was accelerating research by partnering with patient advocates to collect and openly share uh, research grade data. And so now we have this really, this much broader remit around enabling next generation advocacy across support, education, and research. And as I said in my introduction, health equity is a strategic focus for global genes and, you know, really critical because of the significant inequity right now in healthcare. And I mentioned this nine, this 5% of, um, of disorders that have approved therapies. We can turn that around and think about the 95% that don't have approved therapies. And, you know, I want to put a point on this because, um, uh, RareX um, published a study last year that there are actually 10,000 individual rare diseases. And so, um, you know, if we think about, you know, that 95% is a huge, huge number of diseases and it impacts over 350 million people in the world. And so I, you know, I, I think a lot of people say that rare diseases are individually rare, but really common at the aggregate. And um, just in terms of, you know, kind of economic um, burden. Um, so there were three separate studies that were published in 2021 that estimated uh, direct medical costs for rare disease patients in the U.S. And those studies ranged from 400 billion to 800 billion um, a year. And that's just for the U.S. And one of those studies, the one from the Every Life Foundation, also added in indirect medical and non-medical costs. And that totaled a trillion dollars a year again, just for the US. And so, you know, this healthcare burden is, you know, really like staggering, um, you know, in terms of the, the aggregate cost. And, you know, there are so many um, systemic access and equity issues. Um, you know, so if I go back to th the thought about therapies, you know, the good news is, is that there's been tremendous progress. There is tremendous progress that's happening on the therapeutic front. I mean, I get super excited about this from uh, a technologist perspective, you know, there, there's now all of these genetic therapies, AAVs, 
uh, AAV gene therapies, antisense oligonucleotides, um, CRISPR, which you know has gotten quite a lot of press, and it, these are really gonna, starting to make it possible to treat many diseases and possibly even to address the root cause, which is really exciting. And now what we're seeing is, is that there are actually hundreds of rare disease therapies that are in you know, various stages of preclinical development. So this, this landscape is gonna change dramatically over the next um, you know, few years. Um, the challenge that we have is, you know, that we're really, um, you know, and I'm saying this as a, we as a rare disease community, we haven't really, you know, like value assessment hasn't really been, you know, on the um, kind of in, in the forefront. And, you know, so we're really, I think, behind in a lot of ways in terms of preparing for, you know, these therapies, you know, as well as, you know, addressing kind of the, the challenges that we, you know, have today. And so, um, from a health equity standpoint, within you know global genes and RareX, um, we're driving multiple efforts in this area. So first, um, we have an annual health equity summit, and this year is taking place in September. And you know this is a multi-stakeholder forum where we're bringing together patients, researchers, clinicians, you know, regulatory, including the FDA and policymakers, and really to build awareness and importantly to advance discussion around a lot of the thorny issues in health equity. Um, so I'm excited this is going to be the third year this September of this event. The second initiative, and I mentioned this earlier, is around our RareX data collection program. And so collecting robust data for many rare diseases is a significant challenge. And I thought that it was great that Jed said that we need to flip it so that patients can't take all of the responsibility. But you know, even in this area, the reality is, is that the patients are the ones that have the personal urgency. And so because of funding limitations, because it's sometimes hard to get research inter researchers interested if there's no data to begin with, and these challenges around with rare disease, patients are geographically dispersed, so you can't just easily attach, you know, a study to an institution and expect to get um, a large number of patients. So RareX was really designed to address these issues, um, empowering patient advocates to really start the process instead of, um, you know, trying to garner interest from a researcher and enabling patient advocates to co collect really robust research-ready data. Um, and they're able to do that at no cost with, you know, standard surveys from our platform, um, and we're doing this online. And so after a little over a year, so um, I guess a year and a half, we've, we have 3,000 patients, uh, participants who are collecting and sharing data on the platform. And from a value assessment standpoint, we're already collecting quality of life data across participants. And I'm really um, you know, hopeful that this will help us to start creating baseline data for these very understudied disorders um, as inputs into value assessment. So, um, you know, an online platform is, um, you know, is um, useful in, to some extent from an equity standpoint. It eliminates travel and it allows patients to be able to, to participate in their own time. But, you know, clearly it's only one small step, um, you know, in terms of addressing equity. So we're also launching a pilot um, in Kansas City and the state of Alabama called Rare All In. And the goal of this pilot is to develop a community-based model to identify, support, and engage individuals and families who have been impacted by rare disease with the goal of enhancing diversity and equity um, in care and research. And you know, so um, there's a I know that there's a lot of discussion, especially now that the um, you know, FDA has really um, you know, is pushing for much more diversity in clinical trials. But, you know, even before we can think of participation, we really need to address trust issues that are truly profound for, you know, for many, particularly in underserved and marginalized communities. And this, with this pilot, what we're really trying to do is start by meeting patients where they are. So we're partnering with community-based and faith-based organizations and incorporating trained community health liaisons and research ambassadors. And, you know, you can really think of it as layers that we're building trust, 
th then we can start to think about education, then we can start to think about engagement and hopefully participation. And I think that this is really truly fundamental to today's topic. Um, you know, being able to build equity in value assessment, um, to do that, we need to make sure that we have truly diverse representation of all stakeholders at the table. And so I'm really hopeful that this initiative will enable us to better address this issue. So um, I guess you also yeah. asked about um, uh, impact and where we are. So we are just launching this pilot um, mm -hmm. this quarter. And so I'm looking forward to having some initial insights later. Great. This year. Charlene, thank you very, very much. By the way, I want to sort of plant a question with you, if you don't mind. Um, and this has to do with the policy environment supporting or not rare disease, disease drug development. Think about the Orphan Drug Act, for example. And like, has that helped? Does that hurt? Do we need another one? So I don't know if you have any thoughts on something along those lines, but we may come back to you on that. Um, Nellie, can we come back to you on the question we posed earlier with regard to how you sort of build value into an investment strategy? Tell yeah, us. and definitely. And I want to like try also, I think, to, to and maybe I'll do this through my answer. I think it like what I say also hopefully will connect the dots with some of the other remarks that have been okay. made. I mean, I think this piece um, and even in investing in, and I um, had done some work with RareX in the past. So investing in these types of technologies, I think coming in from other parties is hard, right? I mean, they, again, at the end of the day, the bottom line is sort of what these entities are looking at. And sometimes when we are looking at, um, you know, populations within our, like, let's say use the JPMC uh, employee population, and we are looking at specific disparities, our ends get very small and in rare, right. in rare diseases, ends get very small. And so the equity argument um, in some of these groups is, I'm gonna say sometimes a little bit challenging. I think there was a question earlier about ROI. Um, and, and the response is definitely, you know, that I think Jonay mentioned was that it's a moral imperative. The way that I think our team looks at it too is that health equity shouldn't be called health equity, it's just health care, right? It's providing sort of yeah. the same mm -hmm. um, opportunistic care to everyone that you are serving, whether that is individuals with rare diseases, whether that is individuals with insurance, whether that's individuals um, that don't have insurance. And so that is sort of one piece of, I think, a foundation that is for us. And so when we think about that in terms of investments, and a lot of strategic investment companies probably work similarly in terms of how they do due diligence for a company, maybe not how they look at health equity, but due diligence has a very rigorous and um, in some mm -hmm. cases, um, academic and not academic process where there are different factors that they look at, sort of, you know, long-term um, strategy, what their uh, roadmap looks like, um, what their various stages of funding have looked like. We have a scorecard internally that our ventures team has built that sort of addresses a number of those things. Again, with the focus on the three goals of Morgan Health, which is quality, affordability, and equity in an employer-sponsored insurance world. What we have done in the last year is add a lot line item metric that addresses health equity. And so what that actually is entailing is that we are looking at whether the solution complements um, our Morgan Health, equi health Equity Strategy, which um, that is public, so I'm happy to share that, um, whether the solution can help mitigate social determinants of health with potential to scale to widespread populations. So oftentimes many of these solutions are sort of um, triggered towards um, very specific populations. So say within like a, 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 like a diabetes solution is looking at individuals that have an A1C that are at a very specific level, but we are also looking at solutions that maybe include individuals that are um, that could be pre-diabetic or could be at risk for diabetes, um, you know, may have, um, even though I hate BMI as a metric, may have a, a high BMI that are, you know, in, that are obese that are going to be at risk for a longer stage disease. So it's it's that health equity metric that we're including in the scorecard addresses a number of those components. I think that was one for oh. widespread populations. Captures demographic data where the solution is um, sort of has where the solu oftentimes solutions we talk to are in a very specific demographic area. But what is the makeup? What does the demographic makeup look like? Where the solution is actually being utilized? Okay. So, that's what I say when when I say we're integrating health equity. Believe me, Cliff, it is not it is not perfect equity, as Mark said earlier. Um, it oh, is one way for us to to push the company to think a little bit more about what some of the uh, the equity challenges are. Well, I did hear you talk about putting in a line item there, so it's not like you're just waving your hands. That there, it's it's on yeah. it's yeah, on the docket there. It's on the Thanks. docket, and, and 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 even if you know, and I should say that of the investments we've made. 
um, like no one is scoring, it's a zero out of five for us and no one's scoring a five, which I think is known information to everybody that plays. Yeah. In this. Um, so yeah. Good, can thank I you very much. Say, yeah, just, can I just weigh in, Cliff? I, I want to point out on this. that I Go think ahead. is really important about what Nellie just talked about. And that is um, this notion of accountability. Uh, I think one of the reasons why it's been a joy to partner with Nellie and with and to see what Morgan Health is, is doing is because when I say accountability, it's not a, a stick that we wield to beat people over the head and say you're doing it wrong. It's about setting expectations. And I think that what is novel about what Nellie shared is that they're asking different questions. They're asking for evidence of progress towards a goal. And it's to your point, Nellie, it's not a binary, you did it well, or you didn't do it well. This is a journey. This is not something that's going to happen overnight. But the, the point is we all have to start using the leverage we have from where, whatever seat we have to materially change the conversation about values that we're keeping equity at front and center always. Mm -hmm. So, so Nellie talked about it from the standpoint of a major financial leverage, you know, major financial leverage covered lives, an investor fund and the ability to articulate, are you thinking in this direction? That's a huge part of accountability from, and what Charlene said was about a kind of that grassroots from the ground up. How do we build trust towards developing a better insight pipeline? And that's the data. And all of these things have to happen in order for us to really be able to have a conversation about value. And for us, from IVI's perspective, the why is every day, I mean, Charlene just said, there's 10,000 rare diseases. We're only addressing 5% of them. And there's a whole pipeline of of therapies and interventions that are going to come to the market. And we are not prepared to have the conversation about how we're going to uh, afford these. And we mm -hmm. will never get to being able to have that conversation in a way that is representative and equitable if we don't start thinking now, what are the data, what's the data, what are the involvement of patient communities upstream so that we are ready for the conversation when those things come to market. Otherwise, yeah. we'll end up with the current status quo, which is we're using methods and data at the end of the pipe, and it is exacerbating this loggerheads about what's value. And the ultimate loser in that conversation is the patients and families. And we've okay. heard stories about that all the way through this wonderful forum if we hope to change that narrative and be talking five years from now about all the amazing things we've wrought, we have to start thinking upstream and we have to do things completely differently. Yeah, so. I'm gonna ask I'm gonna ask you a question in a moment, Jennifer, about HTA and message to HTA. In the meantime, I wanna add one more little question to Charlene's docket, if you don't mind. I, I already loaded you up with one, but Charlene, we did have a question come in about whether uh, you've got any patients with Dada Data two in your database. I'm, I think it's a, an autoimmune or autoinflammatory disease that's inherited. So just that question about that. Jennifer, just back to you. And if you just kind of give it to us in a, in a nugget here, whether it's from your forthcoming report or something else, what is your bottom line message about equity to HTA organizations or others who are direct or indirect gatekeepers of coverage? Okay, so you got that. So your bottom line message, HT organizations are gatekeepers to coverage. What do they need to know about equity arising from your work? Briefly. Uh, I think the answer is questions of the work. And that, and by that I mean don't take uh, results out of a health technology assessment at face value. Look at what the questions are that are being asked and what are the questions that aren't being asked. I think uh, this field does a, not a good job of doing subpopulation analysis. It doesn't acknowledge the fact that most of the data that we're currently using to make decisions about value is population averages, which we know are not representative. Um, we need to start challenging the status quo and saying, this is not enough, what are you doing? And I would say that the place to start uh, is our, our first domain, power, people, and processes. And by that, we mean you have to start by engaging with the communities whose health you are trying to influence. 
And so if it's major depressive disorder, you need to sit with communities that actually experience the disease so that you can mm -hmm. understand what is the problem you're trying to solve from a medical standpoint? What are those socioeconomic and driver, mm -hmm. other drivers of health? What are the cost impacts? And what's going to materially matter to communities of color? And then you need to partner with, like Charlene mentioned, on the ground community organizations to build that trust. One of the most powerful uh, inputs to our process was a conversation we had with a woman that works with uh, indigenous communities in Montana. And she had a 20 plus year uh, research relationship with the University of Montana uh, researcher who basically showed up one day to a community meeting on the Navajo reservation and said, I wanna understand what your communities are confronting and has, has then been on this research journey to really understand where those communities ex uh, have needs on diabetes, yeah, yeah. mental health, on heart disease, and that's how they've built solutions. Those are that is a far cry from our current status quo in this realm of health technology assessment, in which we take a bunch of garbage data and we pass it through an economic model and we call it a decision. Okay, well, um, you're given a clear message. And uh, we see, we'll see if you deliver it, if it's heard. We'll find out. Thank you. Charlene, back to you. I know I loaded you up with a big question, then a smaller question. Which would you like to do first, please? So I answered the smaller question in the chat, in the Q&A box. So um, we, so I, and quickly, we don't currently have Data2 on the platform. Mm -hmm. We work mm -hmm. directly with patient advocacy groups. So I just gave the person my contact information and others who are, interested, um, please feel free to reach out to me and I can connect you with our patient engagement group. Um, but I think Cliff, you were asking about the Orphan Drug Act and uh, you know what needs to kind of happen going forward. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. Global Genes, it, and I am not a policy person, but I can give you kind of some high level thoughts. I mean, clearly the Orphan Disease Act, you know, from the 80s was huge, you know, a huge catalyst for the rare disease community. And it's taken many, many years to actually impact the drug pipelines that we're now seeing. But it's been pretty exciting, actually, you know, over the last mm. you know, five to 10 years to see how that those, you know, that that transformative act has really started to change things now. Um, you know, from a forward looking perspective, clearly the landscape has changed. And so there's some, you know, tweaking or, you know, significant tweaking that I think that, you know, we have an opportunity for. I think that now, I mean, just to kind of broadening out from the Orphan Disease Act now really is a transformative time. So there's the Orphan Disease Act. There's also, you know, ARPA-H that could really have sure. a transformative, um, you know, impact on, you know, not only rare disease you know, but um, healthcare overall. And so, you know, we, I think that we really as a, um, as a country need to be thinking about how we can, you know, really think about the next, the next chapter. Excellent. Th thank you very much. It's a good way to, to, to address the policy need there. Um, and uh, I think that that provides kind of a good <laughs> wrap on, on where we can go next. Um, one final thing, uh, Charlene, and then, it, and then please convey to Juno that we're glad that you brought her along for a national high level policy deliberation and that she made her contribution to that. We very much appreciate that. Bring her again sometime. <laughs> okay. I will. She, Thank she you. loves people. <laughs> well, we love her too, having heard her story. Thank you very much. Uh, well, we're about out of time for our third panel here. And uh, you heard some compelling stats, uh, important insights into rare conditions and some pretty strong opinions along the way about what we need to do next about incorporating equity into the determination of value. Great, great thanks to Jennifer Bright, Nellie Ganeson, and Charlene Son Rigby. You've made a wonderful sort of capstone to our four panel discussion today. And with that, I am pleased to hand it over to Mike Chernu for some final observations and comments. Mike. We see Mike's uh, graduation picture, but not hearing his voice yet. I am here. I am uh, no. sorry. Gotcha now, Mike. We can hear you. 
you guys are, I just stepped out for 20 seconds before my remarks. So um, I'm sorry, everybody. Thanks for waiting. Um, a few quick remarks before I give my thanks. Um, the first one is, um, what a wonderful uh, day, just in general. I thought all of the panels, and for that matter, panelists were um, outstanding. Um, the one word, if I had to pick one word to sum it all up, the word would be more. Um, <laughs> So here's my view. Um, the first way in which it's more, this is more than just benefit design. We started with a real focus on benefit design, um, but it's just clear from this that this is so much more than benefit design. It's also um, much more than any one stakeholder group. We had um, public folks from um, federal and state level. Um, within the state, there were uh, array, people from the exchanges and otherwise. Um, there were... Um, a bunch of folks in the private sector, not just plans, not just providers, but also employers. Um, so it's clear there's a lot of energy there. Um, the other uh, way in which I would say it's more is that it's clear that much is being done, but there's much more to do. It's really interesting to see the work that's being done in that context. Um, specifically, um, this is more than just lamenting that there's a problem. Um, it's clear and a lot of the panelists mentioned how big the problem is, but I think more encouraging is um, there's sort of a growing list of activities and intervention. So I think we've moved beyond just being um, concerned about um, the problems we have with equity um, in the healthcare system at large. Um, so with that general summary, let me go to give my thanks. So I'd like to thank the panelists. They were really outstanding. I am amazed. Um, you know, I don't get involved much in the agenda and then Mark sends me um, a list of people that are speaking. And I'm always amazed at what a tremendous job he does is at picking people that are at the forefront of these sort of activities. I'm, I've been at a number of these. I don't know which number this is. I, there's a picture of me and Mark when we were much younger. Um, so it must have been a long time ago. Um, um, and Cliff has been uh, with us you know, a long time along the way. And I am constantly amazed at what an amazing job he does um, at moderating this event. It really would never be the same um, without Cliff. Um, I need to give particular thanks to um, the VBID Center staff. I'll shout out to uh, Susan Lynn and Jordan for the job they do. There's a lot it takes to pull this together, and they do just a spectacular job. Um, Mark mentioned sort of the other group. I don't see the slide up. I'm hoping the slide will. There we go. Um, uh, to thank the sponsors. Everything we do um, would be impossible without the support of the sponsors, and it really is um, wonderful to have uh, these group of organizations um, supporting sort of the work we've been doing on uh, VBIT in general and equity. Um, uh, so that brings me to my last thanks, which is a thanks to Mark. So, um, you know, Mark is the uh, energy behind all of this. I think what we've learned um, sort of broadly is that um, both uh, for decades now, Mark was right. Uh, uh, maybe more importantly, Mark's mom was right. Uh, maybe both of them are right. I don't know. We can get up a picture of Mark's mom. But um, when we started, it was pretty clear that one of the problems with high cost sharing um, and barriers in general was an equity problem. And so VBID was sort of at its core from the beginning, uh, an equity enhancing idea. And I think now um, that's just more explicitly recognized. So um, it's nice to see that we finally had a day that really brought that issue front and center. Um, it's tremendous to see the energy. It's tremendous to see the energy in the chat. So um, again, I could not be happier about how the day went. I hope you, all you feel the same. Several people said they come and they learn things they don't learn in other places. Hopefully you've learned some uh, general and some granular uh, pieces of information that will help folks that um, go forward. And so um, I will leave that with a broad thanks to all of you for showing up and um, stay tuned. You will see more from the VBIT Center. Um, it's amazing the reach such a small organization has. And again, um, it could not be possible with, um, without all of you. So again, Mark, do you want to give any closing comments or Cliff? I'd be glad to hear from Mark, but Mike, thank you very much. It's great to work with everybody, always enlightening and energizing. We take this forward and uh, we all have a better reason now to accelerate equity from our own purchase. Thank you all very, very much. Nothing more from me, Cliff, except thanks for everyone. And we're just a little engine that could, just every <laughs> year a little bit more. So thanks to everybody. We have 
several hundred people who stayed through throughout the day. It was truly spectacular. And we'll hope to see you and all your colleagues next year. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care. Bye.